Hello everyone and welcome to our seminar today on Walking the Water Energy Food Nexus Talk. My name is Jen DeRosa. I am the program coordinator for energy and environmental programs here at Johns Hopkins University. And many of us desire to use our skills to help others in this world, to help improve someone's quality of life. Dr. Winston Yu has done just that in places like India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, China, Uzbekistan, Poland, and Armenia. He helped improve people's lives in these different places, working on projects to help protect people from floods, improve irrigation systems, and help governments sustainably manage water resources. Dr. Yu is a senior water resources specialist at the World Bank. It is in this capacity that he works on technical and institutional problems in the water sector and has carried out a number of investment projects in a variety of developing countries. So his interest in water developed during his undergraduate days at the University of Pennsylvania and further flourished when he attended Harvard for his PhD in environmental science and engineering. While at Harvard, he had the opportunity to, to conduct research for the World Bank and explore arsenic contamination that was prevalent throughout Bangladesh's rural water supply. After earning his PhD, Dr. Yu completed a postdoctoral fellowship at Stockholm Environmental Institute, where he modeled climate change and its impacts on water basins in California and China. He also served as an American Associate for the Advancement of Science Fellow at the U.S. Department of State, and Dr. Yu is an adjunct faculty for Johns Hopkins University. In an alumni interview with Harvard University, Dr. Yu once expressed that the biggest challenges he faces is also the most rewarding aspects of his job. And that comes from the people he interacts with. Planning a massive water infrastructure project is one thing, but its success is entirely dependent on the human and the institutional elements that are at play with one another. So we look forward to hearing from him today about the water, energy, and food nexus and kicking off our speaker series for this year. So please join me virtually and in the chat box if you can in welcoming Dr. Winston Yu. Okay, um, thank you, uh, Jen and Jerry and the staff at the AAP program. Um, it's a real delight to be able to share with you some of my ideas and experiences working on water, energy, food. Um, I've been an adjunct at SICE now for 13 years, and last fall, um, which now feels like a lifetime ago, I uh, was asked to develop and deliver a course on the Water Energy Food Nexus. And through that um, course development and then the semester, you know, this question kept coming up, you know, can we really walk the Water Energy Food Nexus talk? And that's the, what I'd like to discuss with you all in the next 30 minutes. Um, you will hear uh, through this talk essentially three main ideas. Uh, the first idea is that indeed there is a lot of complexity and in many cases a lack of detailed understanding on how these three sectors uh, relate and function together. Two, um, and this is not unique to the WEF nexus, but bridging science and research with public po policy um, and implementation in the field is always a challenge. And um, I hope to, in this talk, um, share with you some of the barriers I see to jumping that uh, research practitioner divide. And then thirdly, uh, talk a little bit about the actors who would be involved in this water energy food nexus, because I think that gives you, that will give you some indication as to uh, the challenges with uh, walking the WEF uh, Nexus talk. When I was um, developing the syllabus, um, I did a very quick uh, Google Scholar search uh, to find papers and materials uh, for us to read and came up with over 130,000 search results. Um, so this is certainly an area that is well researched um, and continually uh, remains an area where new innovations and um, a lot of scholarship is being undertaken. 
at the same time, um, you know, depending on your views on the WEF nexus, you know, one could argue that many of the ideas um, are actually fairly old. And so, um, you know, when you think about these ideas um, going back decades and decades ago, one relevant question is whether or not this helps us, you know, thinking about nexus approaches, helps us to accelerate towards um, a variety of development goals that we have set forth for ourselves. And I, I frankly don't have the answer to that, but I think it's something for us to um, continuously think about. Because at the same time as um, you know, some research, researchers have suggested, maybe this is just a buzzword. Um, it's no secret that in our world of development, um, a lot of ideas and concepts go in and out of fashion for a variety of reasons. Um, and I especially like this paper by Rose Cairns from 2016, um, where she is, um, the paper is called Anatomy of a Buzzword, and she's looking at how nexus approaches, um, the history of nexus approaches in UK public policy decision making. And this is her definition of a buzzword, a term whose power derives from a combination of ambiguous meaning and strong normative resonance. Um, and so for some of you out there, you might be nodding your head, yeah, I think this is a buzzword. But I think what I want to emphasize is the word power, that even if it is a buzzword, the implication here is that terms such as the nexus uh, may have value, um, even if not clearly defined, may have value in changing opinions, in changing behaviors, and maybe even setting um, development agendas. And so clearly, um, the interest in the WEF nexus comes from the fact that all three of these topics matter. Right? If you look at water, energy, food, we have billions of people who don't have access. And let's just look at some of those numbers. 1.4 billion without access to electricity, 3 billion without access to modern fuels or technologies for cooking and heating, 900 million who lack access to safe water, 2.6 billion who do not have improved sanitation, more than 900 million who are chronically hungry due to extreme poverty, and 2 billion who lack food security intermittently. And of course, for each one of these bullets, you could spend semesters and years and decades of your life trying to understand and trying to improve that situation. Um, at the same time, you know, this is not static. We know that all three will continue to matter in the future. And um, I don't know how uh, confident you are with your guesses, um, but if we think that there will be a future population of 9 billion people by 2050, um, what that means, according to one report, is overall food production increase by about 70%, and certainly in the developing country context, even more so. Now, with that population increase, we also expect to see increases in energy demand, and so how are we going to produce that energy to meet that demand. Um, there was a, a nice series of reports several years back uh, from the World Bank called Thirsty Energy. And in those modeling reports, um, they demonstrated that by 2035, energy consumption would increase by 35%. And what that meant from a water perspective was increasing water consumption by 85% and water withdrawals by 20%. And so this population growth is not only um, increasing our need for more food, but also greater energy demands, but also uh, global water demands. And not only water for energy and food, but water for a variety of other reasons, um, inland navigation, uh, perhaps recreation for some countries, and then also water as an important um, driver and life support for important environmental assets and ecosystems. And then also keep in mind, the future is gonna be much more uncertain, especially in the context of climate change. And I think many scholars agree that we expect to see more variability and more extremes. And we know, and we've seen the impacts of floods and droughts and cyclones, storm surges, hurricanes, all of that on water, energy, and food. So why does understanding these interconnections matter to sustainable development? Well, you know, I think generally people do understand these interconnections. Um, for instance, if we look at water and energy, we all recognize that water is heavy and that it takes a lot of energy to move that water, north, south, east, west, 
um, energy is required to pump from aquifers. Um, water is needed, energy is also needed to produce water. So whether we're talking about energy in a wastewater treatment plant like we have here um, in Washington, D.C., or um, as you find in many parts of the world, particularly in the Middle East, uh, energy requirements for desalinization. Now the flip side is that for energy production, we also need water. Um, and so beyond hydropower, we need water for cooling, for um, thermal generation plants. Um, we need water as part of the extractive process. Um, fracking right now is very much on the agenda and, and it's well documented the water impacts of fracking. And then also if we are moving towards um, prioritizing biofuels, that requires water. The linkages between water and food also I think are generally well known. We need water to produce food. Um, we need water to produce forestry products. Uh, we need water for um, fisheries and then also for fodder crops for livestock. And in the context of changing diets and increased demand for meat, uh, one needs to think about where will the grains to feed that meat um, uh, come from. And then finally, energy food. Um, we recognize that energy is needed to produce food, whether it is, as I mentioned earlier, to pump water to, um, for irrigation purposes or to run a high efficiency pressurized system all the way throughout the value chain. So you need energy to produce fertilizers, um, energy for transportation, uh, logistics, agro-processing, so forth and so forth. Okay, and this is all, as I mentioned earlier, in the context of climate change, land use change, and other perhaps demographic and geographic um, changes. So in general, these interconnections are well understood. But as you get into more, let's say, context-specific understandings, if we go to a specific place on this planet, I would argue that though that understanding is not always clear. We may not always have the data to understand um, the, the connections. And the reason it's important is, or at least you know, the, the hypothesis is that we miss out on important co-benefits, okay? That we create externalities, that perhaps we operate in a, a less than sustainable manner when we don't think about all three, that perhaps we are operating in a suboptimal uh, manner uh, from a uh, economic efficiency and equity perspective. Okay, and so to maybe drill a little bit deeper, I just wanted to show this picture. This is a photograph taken by Edward Bertinsky, a Canadian photographer, and I always use this in my um, water course at SICE. Um, this, uh, he several years ago put together a nice uh, collection of photographs called Water. And um, it's one of these books that um, sort of pushes the reader to think about the relationship we as humans have with water, but also the ways in which we as society have um, uh, worked to change nature and to bend nature to, to our will. And I think this is a perfect illustration of that. Um, this is an image of a center pivot irrigation system outside of Yuma, um, Arizona. And if I'm a water person, my first question is, what's the opportunity cost of using this water to produce this crop here in this desert? Clearly, this is not a, an area on the planet that naturally would be suitable for um, growing agricultural products. From the food perspective, I might be asking, well, should this crop be grown? Um, you know, what's the market for it? Are there adequate um, logistics and transportation facilities to move this product uh, to um, a market? Um, is this crop suitable for export, et cetera? And of course, if you're an energy person, you might look at this center pivot and say, okay, well, again, just like in the water um, perspective, you know, what's the opportunity cost of using that energy here as opposed to somewhere else? And so therein lies one of the challenges, right? From the water, individual water, energy, and food perspectives, we may have our own individual objectives, which in their own rights make a lot of sense. But when we take a step back, perhaps another kind of objective, another question to ask is, is all of this production and all these inputs generating an adequate livelihood for this farmer? Okay, and here, you know, let's pretend this is not Arizona, but somewhere else in the world. Um, is all of this input and attention here 
generating um, uh, growth for the state or the country? Um, is this the best use of resources, public resources, from a poverty perspective? Okay, and so the point I want to make is, you know, this answer to this question really depends on what level we are thinking about. Certainly, um, national level agricultural policies, um, policies that are encouraging certain kinds of crops, as you can see from this image, would impact the water energy uh, uh, inputs. Um, certainly water allocation policies, you know, how do we prioritize scarce water resources across different uses would impact what's being grown here. And certainly energy policies, right? If we're, if the energy that is being used here is coming from solar versus wind versus more traditional fuels, you can imagine there are impacts, okay? Now, um, just on the issue of some examples of externalities, um, as Jen mentioned, I, I worked in India for a long time, in South Asia, you know, a long time. And many of you are probably familiar with the Green Revolution um, in India and South Asia, and in many ways, uh, a success story in building food security for these countries and also reducing the risks of famine. Um, but many will also argue that this Green Revolution was also a pump revolution. Um, if you look at the uh, what the advent of cheap pumps has done in terms of production, it's, it's astounding. Uh, this image here on the lower left is just the irrigated area by uh, different tube wells in Bangladesh since the 70s. And you see this uh, dramatic rise. Similarly in India, um, since the 70s, essentially irrigated area has doubled. So gone from about 50 million hectares of irrigated land to 100 million hectares of, of irrigated land. And so in many ways, we've achieved our food objectives. Um, but um, as many of you may know, um, that combined with heavy subsidies on the energy sector side, so subsidies for diesel, or in some cases like in Northwestern India, essentially free electricity, we're seeing over abstraction of groundwater wells. And this image is from, a, I believe it's a nature paper. Um, showing some major aquifers around the world and how they're changing. This light blue uh, line on the bottom is from northwestern India, okay, where you see this precipitous decline in um, uh, water levels. And it, it's so severe um, that the GRACE satellite, many of you might be familiar with, shows it very, very clearly. So a case where um, the water energy food nexus, one could argue, has broken down and we have some externalities. At the same time, though, uh, maybe this is a water energy food opportunity. Um, I spent some time with the International Water Management Institute, which is a, a, a water think tank based out of Sri Lanka, Colombo. And one of the things they're doing there is looking at the opportunity with solar irrigation. And here in India, the idea is to introduce solar irrigation um, on those farms where they're over abstracting groundwater, where the farmer is given a choice, either use the energy to pump to grow a crop or use that energy and sell it back to the grid to essentially um, treat energy like another crop. And of course, the, the interesting research question is, is where do you set that feed in tariff? If the tariff is too high, then you get no production whatsoever. And yes, you've saved groundwater, you've stopped abstractions, uh, but how is that influencing uh, local food markets, local food prices, and overall food insecurity? If you set it too low, then you don't change the behaviors of the farmers. They'll continue to uh, pump from the groundwater. So perhaps um, by thinking about water and energy food nexus, there are also opportunities. In our water field, we also talk a lot about wasting water. Um, this is a picture from Armenia, uh, uh, a pressurized system, and you see this uh, water leakage. I think it's also important that whenever we see this kind of water leakage, it's also energy being wasted. Um, and this is big on the agenda, especially for the utilities, water utilities. Uh, we need to keep in mind that any improvements we make to non-revenue water or any improvements in, to um, situations like this, that we're also making improvements on the energy side. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I also, um, you know, a big part of my work has been focused on trying to improve services to farmers, irrigation services, 
Um, this image on the upper left-hand side is a you know, typical canal that I, we may face. Um, and you know, with World Bank financing, the idea is to uh, rehabilitate and modernize this infrastructure. Um, at the same time, we often work um, with governments to try to strengthen the institutions. And one of the things, and this is um, you know, almost 10 years ago, uh, was we were trying to um, introduce some uh, modern business processes um, into the departments. So um, the use of computers at a bare minimum for accounts payables, human resources, all those kinds of things. And this image here on the right is me visiting a, um, a remote field office. Um, and I'm speaking here with the engineers and um, the conversation is, um, revolves around this typewriter that you may see in the picture. Um, under the project, we had distributed hundreds and hundreds of computers. And when I arrived, I kept asking about the computer and they kept pointing to the, the typewriter. And I eventually found out that the computer was, was left unboxed. They didn't, they couldn't, they didn't, they didn't, they weren't using the computers. And the reason? Uh, no electricity, or at least they didn't have a stable electricity connection, right? And so we, we ended up having to purchase generators to get around that. But my point I want to make is that often when water and energy are not working in tandem, it has impacts on all kinds of other sectors beyond the water, energy, food nexus. Now, I have to talk about water infrastructure um, if we're going to talk about the water, energy, food nexus. Um, this is another picture from Edward Bertinsky. It's a, a dam on the Yangtze River in China. And the reason I'm, we need to talk about this is um, structures like this. You know, a lot of dams, though lots of controversy, um, most of the dams around the world are multi-purpose. And you'll find plenty of cases where dams are not only providing water for drinking, but also generating energy and also um, providing water for irrigation, so for food. And so in many ways, these multi-purpose dams sit right at the center of the water energy food nexus. If you take a step back, you start to think, well, you know, somebody, or there's some process to make decisions about how we allocate and how we prioritize water energy food. And as you think about that, you quickly realize that, okay, well, you know, you're, you, you, um, this, these end up being uh, political, socioeconomic uh, uh, issues. And it's no surprise then that um, often the WEF nexus is um, discussed in terms of, of security, broad security issues. Um, I'm not going to go through definitions um, because there are multiple definitions of water security, multiple definitions of food security and energy security. But the point I want to make here is that as soon as we start talking about security and how these uh, basic needs relate to national security, we also often end up in these geopolitical contexts where we um, are talking about uh, national security, regional security, um, and relationships between countries. And that is, no, that is so clear to me, um, especially when I think about uh, Central Asia where I worked uh, for many years. Um, for those of you who know, these countries were once um, part of the Soviet Union. Um, water could be moved anywhere you wanted it to be moved to. Um, central planning, energy was cheap. Um, and then during the breakup of the Soviet Union, these different countries emerged and what came out of the breakup of the Soviet Union is essentially this water, energy, food conflict. What you have is that in the upstream portions of these basins, so Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, um, you find tremendous opportunity for hydropower. And certainly in the winter months, huge needs to generate cheap energy. Okay? I mean, you can get access to gas, but it's very expensive. Okay? Um, and this is in conflict with downstream Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan, where in the summer months, they need water for agriculture. Um, and this is partly agriculture for domestic consumption, but in large part, um, if you look at how much cotton and wheat is being produced in Uzbekistan, also for um, export. So, you know, the water, energy, food nexus um, may also be, um, uh, uh, may also from that nexus arise uh, different conflicts between countries. And so a lot, as I said, you know, over 130,000 um, writings on this topic. 
um, going back to you know, an important bond conference in 2011 to this UN World Water Assessment uh, Program report from 2014, the language and the call for action is pretty consistent. You know, everyone is um, recognizing the need to consider broader influences and cross-sectoral impacts, the need to integrate, the need to have more dialogue, more collaboration, and more coordination. Okay, and we uh, keep repeating these calls to action. And my question is, is you know, are we um, you know closer to um, achieving these development goals? Um, so you know, what what are some of the barriers? I let me say from the from the beginning, I am a big supporter of the sustainable development goals and the previous uh, Millennium Development Goals. Um, these SDGs are uh, is an important framing for the global community. And certainly every country I've worked in, and I would probably argue every country that is engaged in development, um, we all look to the SDGs. Um, at the same time, if I put on the WEF Nexus hat, notice that we have a separate goal on water, a separate goal on food, and a separate goal on energy. And again, I'm not um, making a value judgment on that. Um, there's perfectly good reasons to do it this way, but it's also why you see others coming up with alternatives. Um, some of you may know um, Joachim Rostrom's work. Um, he runs the Stockholm Resilience um, Center out of Sweden. And, and um, many years ago, he came up with uh, what he calls this wedding cake approach. And for him, he suggests, well, maybe the organizing principle should be around food, since we all are consumers and or producers of food. And if you were to take that approach, maybe you would organize the sustainable development goals like these concentric circles, so starting from the biosphere, working up to society, up to the economy. One of the things I think that also emerges from this work relates to his earlier work also on planetary boundaries. I mean, in the end, um, we do need to figure out what is the scale with which we're looking at and what are those boundaries. And I think the planetary boundaries approach is a, is a good first order approach to getting to those boundaries, whether you know, it's the phosphorus or nitrogen cycles and limits of that, limits of ocean acidification, so forth and so forth. On the freshwater side, you know, clearly as water people, this is the physical system we have to deal with. Okay, and this is, you, you know, we can't defy the, uh, this hydrologic cycle and the physics behind it. A few things to note though. Um, one, um, it's a very dynamic system. Um, certainly a tremendous exchange between the water, land, and atmosphere. There's a lot of uncertainty um, in this um, system. Um, we need to make distinctions between um, blue water and green water. And the distinction, uh, just to clarify, you know, green water is that water that is consumed by vegetation, which if done so cannot be used by other uh, users in the system. And this is in contrast to the blue water. So for instance, water that's flowing over a turbine that could be used by a user downstream if the timing um, is, is correct. And so just to summarize, you know, we have this very dynamic system um, averages don't make much sense in, in the world of hydrology and, and water. And so perhaps in thinking about the WEF Nexus, we start first with this uh, physical foundation, and then we add to it the food system, and there's a tremendous amount um, to look at along this entire value chain, and then look at the energy system from generation to transmission to distribution and all the, the full uh, range of policy issues that, that various people are, are working on to put it all together. Of course, there are some common characteristics amongst these three big um, topics that do help us facilitate um, Nexus thinking. One, these are all resource constrained, right? We don't have infinite water, food, or energy. Certainly there are global impl implications in it, and it does involve um, international trade. Um, water perhaps less so, but in the context of virtual water and water embedded in products, um, one could think of, of trade in that sense. Also, all have different regional availability and variations in supply and demand, strong interdependencies with climate change and the environment. And as I mentioned earlier, all have deep security issues. 
all operate in heavy regulated markets. Um, of course, on the water side, the experience with water markets per se is fairly mixed. And then finally, all require the explicit identification and treatment of risks. Okay. And now, in thinking about people, um, there are very few people who are actually experts in all three areas. And this is perhaps one of our, our biggest challenges, right? We have water people, energy people, and agriculture people, um, but few people and few programs out there um, designed to facilitate more integrative and nexus thinking. And, you know, is it needed? I, I don't know. Um, you know, maybe um, this is the best way to do it. Um, there's, um, I was using in my WEF class, um, an edited volume by uh, Felix Dodd and Jamie Bartram. And in that volume, there was a, a paper by Gary Lawrence um, that I especially liked. The paper was called The Confederacy of Experts, The Crushing Nexus of Silos, Systems, Arrogance, and Irrational Certainty. And one of his big messages is about, um, you know, our ability to predict the future. Um, and, um, you know, often the overconfidence we may have in uh, estimating impacts of different policies, and in particular, with respect to the WEF nexus, understanding how different, um, uh, in, how the different relationships between uh, water, energy, food have feedback loops and, and so forth. And so this is a, a conclusion from his um, paper. He says, as we think about our future and what we need to do as governments, corporations, planners, designers, builders, and citizens to protect and sustain our communities, we must recognize two things. One, we are in fact all in the agriculture business. So you know, he's sort of taking a page out of the Rockstrom book and thinking about food as a central organizing principle. And two, uh, and this is what I liked most, not one of us is an expert in knowing the future, right? Um, and so I think when we think about the water, energy, food nexus, it's, it's healthy to always keep that um, in mind. Okay, on players, you know, who is involved in this um, nexus landscape? Um, as the World Economic Forum mentioned, you know, certainly a key challenge is to incorporate uh, the complex interconnections of this nexus of risks into response strategies that are integrated and take into account the many relevant stakeholders. So we have a lot of stakeholders. And let me start with myself. Um, you have World Bank and many other regional development banks providing financing, you have bilaterals, um, all kinds of assistance programs out there that are providing credits, loans, grants um, to do things in this space. Um, for full disclosure, um, from the World Bank side, we are internally not really organized along the nexus. Um, we have our water team, we have our energy team, we have our agriculture team. Um, and I would argue um, that that's probably true across all the international financial institutions, and it's probably true across uh, most of the bilaterals are, that are out there. At the same time, um, that mirrors, and perhaps that's why we're organized like this, that mirrors our government counterparts. So if you think about here in the United States, U.S. Department of Agriculture, U.S. Department of Energy, and water is spread throughout. The same I would say is true in terms of civil society and a variety of advocacy organizations and even the research and university communities, right? Um, if you think about different academic programs that are out there and different NGOs, most will fall along one of these three um, uh, topics, water, energy, or food, or maybe, you know, um, like WRI, you may have different groups within um, an institution working on all three. But again, um, you know, are there universities out there? Are there NGOs that have specific interests in this intersection? Probably very few. And as I mentioned from the beginning, um, on the research and university side, you know, over 130,000 articles being written, how much of that is getting into practice, you know, and I think part of the, the reason we don't see that much is in part because of these things I've mentioned before, the way uh, the financiers are organized in governments. And then um, I've put private sector here because we can't ignore the private sector. Um, part of the WEF nexus, and I would say the interest is a public one, and so to what degree is the private sector um, and their interests compatible with the public? Okay, so I've just got um, 
two more slides and I want to summarize um, by reflecting on uh, sort of summarizing what, what I see as the big operational challenges to making the water and energy food nexus um, practical and implementable. One is uh, the clear institutional challenge. Um, nexus boundaries seldom intersect with administrative and political boundaries. Um, even in my own field of water, where we are often trying to promote um, integrated water resources management in a river basin context, because that is the physical boundary and the, the most sensible physical unit for management, we have such a hard time in doing that because those river basin boundaries don't intersect country boundaries, state boundaries, local boundaries, and so forth and so forth. Okay, and so if you add on top of that, the food shed, the energy shed, um, it's no surprise that we have uh, difficult boundaries um, to, to cross. Secondly, on information and data, um, you know, understanding these linkages on a broad scale, I think we all get it. Um, but as you get more into details and you, know, you look at a particular pixel on the earth, for instance, um, we may not fully understand the biophysical situation and the relationship between surface water and groundwater and what feedbacks might exist between the, you know, a river basin and energy production in that basin and food production, et cetera. The third is relates to incentives. Um, in that Rose Cairns uh, buzzword article I mentioned earlier, um, she has this wonderful term, integrative imaginary. Uh, meaning this assumption that integration um, of sectors, disciplines, knowledge, and even stakeholders is possible and desirable. Um, I just want to share with you an experience I had um, working in Tamil Nadu uh, in India, another state in India, uh, where we were trying to, through our project, uh, put in place a integrated water resource planning process. And so the idea, idea there was for every river basin, um, we would pull together um, staff, planning staff from agriculture departments, horticulture departments, fishery departments, livestock departments, irrigation departments, et cetera, et cetera. Basically all stakeholders uh, who would have some relationship to the water resource. And, you know, we workshopped ideas and principles and, you know, had a lot of discussions. And I recall um, coming back six months later and being given um, the plan, the integrated plan. And I looked through this plan, first page was table of contents, and I noticed that each chapter was an individual department chapter. And I turned to my colleagues and I said, you know, where's the integration? And I think one of uh, the counterparts jokingly said to me, well, you know, the staple that is, that is connecting all these pieces of paper is the integrator. Um, so, you know, the reality is uh, doing integrated planning, even in the water space, is a challenge because, you know, when you work in bureaucracies and you've got your day job and all of a sudden an outsider is coming in and trying to impose some new ideas, you know, you face a lot of, of inertia. And so then to think about how we work across the water, energy, and food boundaries, you can imagine, is difficult. And then lastly, on investments, um, and this mirrors a little bit on the institutional side, um, you know, at the World Bank, as you will see um, in other banks as well, and other bilaterals, we have water projects, energy projects, agriculture projects. Of course, um, more and more, we do see elements, you know, in, in most of the irrigation projects I work on, there's always an, an agricultural component because you know if you're going to provide irrigation water of course you want to make sure what's being produced has markets has support has extension services and whatnot um, if we're moving to drip we have to think about energy because where is that energy going to come from does it make sense etc so yes in some respects projects and investments are integrated but do they go the full um, mile with respect to weft nexus perhaps not always and so the, the thing i want to leave you with um, is one, certainly I think there's a lot of value and power, um, as Rose Cairns put it, to the idea of the nexus approach. Um, and I do think there are um, opportunities to change minds and um, move the needle on a variety of, of development targets. Um, I think what are needed, and this ended up being the focus of our course, was on tools and models to support an understanding of those interlinkages and 
most importantly, help support decision making. Um, governments are making decisions all the time and setting policies all the time about water, energy, um, and food. And to the degree that there are tools out there to help in thinking through the implications of a variety of policies on this nexus and the feedbacks, I think that's where, where we're headed um, from the research side. And I think that is research indeed um, that would help support practical um, interventions being, being done and supported by um, you know, various stakeholders. Um, just as an example, this is from a, a paper by Bazillion and others where they attempted to model water energy food systems. And this is just a, a overly simplified cartoon. Um, as you can imagine, every single line in here, um, there's some functional representation. And you, know, you do have to ask yourself, uh, when you build a model like this with so much uncertainty, how much can you trust what comes out of it? Okay. And so I do think um, there's a lot of, of ground truth and calibration, a lot more um, scholarship to help make these kinds of things more digestible for uh, policymakers, but even for the technocrats to really fully understand um, you know, what uh, the, the power of these different kinds of models and how it can help support different um, uh, support different decision, decisions in the water, energy, food uh, nexus space. And so with that, um, I want to thank you for your time, and I, and I look forward um, in the next, uh, uh, however much time we have left, to um, have a conversation with you about this. Thank you. Thank you, Winston. I hope you can hear me okay. Um, I, we do have a couple of questions in the chat. And for anyone that can hear me, if you have any questions, please go ahead and add them to the chat. Um, I'll ask our first question now. Um, our first question is, as you are probably aware, there is a school of thought in the water security studies that uh, asserts that water is a universal human right. With the water energy food nexus in mind, does a water, does a right to water mean that energy must also be treated as a human right? And how would we get policymakers to acknowledge this linkage? Yeah, that's a, a, a wonderful question. Um, the way I would think about this is, um, you know, I'm in, uh, in, from my personal perspective, yes, I think water should be a universal uh, human right. Um, at the same time, um, providing drinking water to uh, communities, people, um, does cost money, right? And it requires energy. Um, and so in some sense, um, I think, you know, whether energy is a right or not is immaterial to um, whether water should be a human right or not. You know, um, governments, um, you know, you have some governments that in their legislation, um, they have declared that, yes, you know, we're going to ensure that everybody has a certain amount of water. And that is a public responsibility. Um, of course, some communities will be more expensive to provide that water because perhaps they need um, to use energy to move water. And in other places, perhaps not. And so I think they are, they are two separate. I would, I would keep these two things um, separate. Um, also, you know, as a, as a water person, I can't speak so much to the, the energy side. And, and, you know, in some sense, I'm probably a good example of what I've been talking about on this WEF nexus. Um, I, you know, getting people to, to, to meet these SDGs on the water side requires a tremendous amount of, of resources. Um, and um, making those resources available, um, you know, I think would certainly help um, us in achieving uh, these SDGs on water. Over. All right, one of our other questions. Um, another uh, viewer wanted to know, they were interested in um, regenerative agriculture and they wanted to know, is the World Bank integrating regenerative agriculture into its work? Sorry, re regenerative agriculture meaning? Um, I'm not actually sure, so I think they could Maybe they could elaborate a bit more on that in the chat section and we'll come back to that. Um, another question was, um, if you could go back to your last slide, um, how to integrate the models that you talked about in your last slide into policymaking process and to facilitate the adoption of those by agencies when making decisions. If you could uh, speak to that a little bit more. Yeah, it, 
it's um it's messy <laughs> um you know i'll you know I, I usually accompany this um this slide also um i don't remember how many years ago but there was legislation here in the united states uh, put forward into the house uh, requiring um, integrated energy and water planning and so the idea um, in, in my read of that legislation was to encourage these kinds of modeling frameworks. Obviously, this is done at a technocratic level, and certainly uh, there's a dimension of art in taking whatever results you, you get from these kinds of models to put it into policy terms. Um, I think that the, the biggest challenge with in, in going from this to policy is the uncertainty aspect, right? Um, you know, my old advisor used to uh, tell me that, you know, all models are wrong, um, but maybe some are useful. And, you know, I think that's, that's real, the real uh, metric of success is, you know, can these models be done in a way and produce information in such a way that it is useful to policymakers. And so, you know, there's a big um, effort, um, both in the water, energy, and I would, I would suspect in the food communities, that in this kind of modeling, we, we often try to engage policymakers early in the development of these tools so that we make sure we're answering the right um, questions. Um, I think the days of technocrats building a model and giving it to a decision maker are, are long and gone. Certainly on the water community, we are doing more and more um, on participatory uh, model development, but participatory development and decision support tools, these kinds of things. Thank you. All right, thank you. So we can go back to the last question. I have a little bit more information from our question asker. So um, by regener regenerative agriculture, um, they're referring to no-till, no fertilizers and pesticides, um, cycling crops to restore nutrient balance and things like that. To what extent is the World Bank integrating that type of regenerative agriculture into its work, if you could speak to that. Yeah, simply put, yes, um, for sure. Uh, we are doing all that. Um, many projects are trying to adopt these practices. I would say, um, you know, of course, the adoption of new practices, again, this is sort of jumping from research to the practitioner, um, is surprisingly difficult, even when one can demonstrate um, yield improvements to no-till and, and a variety of other um, approaches. Um, you know, and I think part of it is a, a risk issue, a communication of risk issue. Um, you know, as I said, I worked with many farmers in India, um, and we often talk about the environment where um, you have um, uh, minimum support prices for certain commodities. And so farmers really don't need to think too much about what they're doing and they're, they're, they're given a guaranteed price and you know, they, they practice what they've been practicing for generations and generations. And, to, and so to break that um, is, is not always, always easy. But for sure, um, you know, my ag colleagues um, um, in, con in conjunction with the FAO and EFAD and other of the big agricultural organizations out there in the, in the CGIAR um, where I was with EMI, you know, a lot of new innovations are being tried. I think the, uh, the other challenge between, uh, besides um, promoting adoption is also how do we scale, scale these things. Um, and, you know, the, the, the pump story I told earlier is one of those one of those examples where pumps were introduced and you know scaling happened very quickly markets developed and you had a very robust supply chain of parts manufacturers and all of that right so how do we get um you know i mean not with respect to no-till but you know other practices introduced and you know allowed them to flourish i, th I think that that is a big um, research to practice jump that uh, many of us are are struggling and, and trying to um, do Thank you. Um, all right, our next question is, to what extent, if any, is AI uh, being used to model these complex, disseparate systems that make up the water energy food nexus and arrive at a, a recommended solution? So artificial intelligence specifically. Yeah, no, uh, another great question. Um, if you haven't seen it, there's a World 
um, economic forum report called the fourth industrial revolution on water. Um, and, you know, we are definitely in an age um, where um, there is a tremendous amount of data out there. I'm thinking in terms of remote sensing data sets and, and whatnot, and opportunities for AI are, are there. Um, I would say where I'm seeing it, a lot of it's on operations. So, you know, using AI to help better run a utility, uh, less so in the irrigation side. Um, but I think in terms of understanding interlinkages, for sure. Um, you know, of those 130,000 search results, you are seeing uh, more and more um, researchers using those techniques to better understand um, these interconnections at the local scale. So yes, uh, that's a, an emerging field that I'm quite excited to, to see what happens. Thank you. Our, our next question is actually more of a, a focused question on some of our students or prospective students that are, are paying attention today. Um, what path would you recommend for a student who wants to pursue a career path in this particular type of field? Um, so which field? I mean, I, I am completely biased. I think everyone should be in the water field. Uh, we have enormous sustainable development challenges. So <laughs> that's what I would, I would promote. Um, but is the question about the WEF nexus and that is a field of study? I believe, yes, I believe we're asking about someone who wants to sort of enter studying and working as a practitioner and scholar in the WEF nexus. Okay. Um, I mean, you know, so, you know, my, my own personal background, you know, I, I um, came from what was once called the Harvard Water Program and the, the, uh, the kernel of the, the sort of the, the center of gravity of that program was actually a bunch of systems thinkers, so people working in fields of operations research, systems modeling, systems thinking. And, you know, I'll tell you, it's interesting. I, I remember at that time, um, you know, these are models to think about interconnections. And often the criticism was, well, you're not modeling the water bit in depth enough, or you're not modeling the energy part in depth enough, or you're not modeling the food part in depth enough, right? So I think there's always going to be the struggle between how wide and how deep to go. Um, so, you know, for sure, um, there, there's a whole branch of science out there, systems engineering, which is all about systems and connecting different things one could, one could study. But as I said, you know, um, you know, do we need to be experts in the WEF Nexus? I, I'm, not, I, I'm not entirely convinced, and I, and I left that as an open-ended question. You know, I think for sure we, we need experts in water, energy, food, uh, sectors themselves because those challenges are, are enormous and there's so much to do. Um, but, you know, I mean, I think if you're interested in, in WEF issues specifically, I mean, I would encourage you to then to look at, you know, kind of systems engineering kind of approaches or, um, you know, there, there may be other uh, analogous um, programs on the kind of social sciences side of things as well. Thank you. I think that does help with um, a lot of our folks that are looking at entering into this type of field. Um, so we've actually had several people ask questions that are all clustered around the same kind of thing. So I'm going to lump them together as best I can. Um, many people are asking how can state government or uh, larger government and the private sector align and work together on the WEF nexus? And and some are even asking more specifically um, about how can investing be a component in maximizing Nexus solutions. So since those are sort of in the same thread, I thought I'd pair those together. Yeah, um, so this, this goes back a little bit to the slide I showed of the um, irrigation um, center pivot systems. I, I think part of it is as a community, again, whether it's from state governments, national governments, or local governments, um, at whatever scale you, you, you carve out, the question is, what's your objective? Um, and, you know, traditionally, um, as a water person, my targets and my objectives in any project that we would finance might be um, area of hectare, hectares um, with improved irrigation services, 
right? Energy colleagues might have something similar and certainly on the ag side, it might be, um, as was mentioned earlier, something like adoption of no-till, right? Um, and again, not to undermine those as objectives in itself, but I think if we want to force greater WEF thinking, maybe the objective should be about farmer livelihoods. You know, maybe the objective should be uh, trying to increase income of farmer by, you know, so many percent, in which case then it challenges teams to figure out um, how best to do that. What package, what, uh, what, you know, sets of interventions would be needed to achieve that. Now, um, I have also been in that debate about whether or not that's a good metric. And, you know, always uh, the complaint is, well, if you make that the objective, what's to say that, you know, you have six years of wonderful rainfall and, you know, the, the farmer um, has abundant resources, completely exogenous to your interventions. And that's all valid, right? Um, so I think part of the answer to the question is about objective setting and what we're trying to achieve. Um, you know, I have nothing against individual um, um, water, energy, food targets, but I do think if we, if we want to force ourselves, uh, my institution and the bilaterals and other IFIs should be setting, I, I would say, more macro um, targets. Thank you. I think that also helps too in the, some others earlier on had asked about how do we frame and communicate this to decision makers in the process. And I think that also helps us think about that as well um, in your response. Um, that actually is all of the questions that I have compiled from the chat. And we are actually about three minutes away from three o'clock. So I just want to thank you very much for being our featured speaker for today and launching our, uh, our Water Energy Food Nexus speaker series for this year. And uh, before we sign off, I want to have everyone give a chance to say thank you and, and uh, a shout out to you in the chat because um, it's not quite the same as having clapping <laughs> in, a, in, a, in a seminar hall. Um, but thank you very much. And if anyone wants to reach out to Dr. Yu um, about any aspect of the talk, his email is on this final slide. There you go, you're getting a lot of applause virtually. Thank you everyone, I appreciate it. Thank you very much. And thank you everyone for joining us today. Okay. Thank you, bye-bye.